Exercises 13 and 14 will be done during the same lab. Exercise 13 is on antiseptics and disinfectants, and this will be the information necessary in order to do your independent project. And exercise 14 is on antimicrobial susceptibility testing that will be useful when you do your in-lecture project called SimPatient. This lab is going to introduce you to disk diffusion testing, after which you will design and execute an independent experiment. In exercise 13, there are a few terms that you should be familiar with, and the first is an antiseptic. This is an antimicrobial agent that is used on living or animate tissue. A disinfectant, on the other hand, is an antimicrobial agent used on inanimate surfaces or objects. The products can be either antiseptics or disinfectants, and some products can be used on both animate and inanimate objects. Sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach, for example, is only used on a as a disinfectant. It should, be, should not be used on living tissue. Isopropyl alcohol, on the other hand, is both an antiseptic and a disinfectant. We can use isopropyl alcohol for disinfecting medical instruments, for example, such as thermometers, and we can also use it as a degerming agent on the skin. There are a number of factors that influence, influence how an antimicrobic is going to work. First is the effectiveness of the anti-ingredient against the microbe. There are a number of targets that these agents are going to act against, and the microorganism must have the target. For example, if the agent acts against cell walls and the microorganism doesn't have a cell wall, then it's not going to be affected by it. The concentration of the microbe in the environment. Is it a heavy load of microbe, for example, as in feces, or is it a suspected light load of uh, contaminants, such as would be in a blood smell, spill? Also, the concentration of the active ingredient. How much of the active ingredient is present in the product, and what is the appropriate dilution for making the product so that the active ingredient is most effective? how long the microbes are going to be exposed to the active ingredient or to the product is also a consideration. The temperature of the environment is going to play a role as well. You may have noted, for example, on a bottle of Lysol that you're going to use to disinfect your bathroom and it has to be diluted. They indicate that it should be diluted in warm water and not cold water. The temperature can make a difference in the activity of an antimicrobial agent. The pH is going to make a great deal of difference. Some agents are completely inactivated in higher or lower pHs. A very good example of that is quaternary ammonium compounds. And finally, the presence of organic material. This is something that we have to consider in clinical situations because blood spills, fecal material, vomitus, body oils, or dead skin are often present along with the microbes. This organic material can influence the way that an agent is going to work. I like this image of the different Lysol products because Lysol is a pervasive product in our market. And uh, you look at these products and you think that they all have the same active ingredient, whereas they really don't have the same active ingredient. The original Lysol product had orthophenylphenol. Orthophenylphenol has been taken off the market, and there are a number of different um, active ingredients in Lysol, including quaternary ammonium compounds and triclosan. There are a number of ways to test the effectiveness of a product, and when you look at a bottle, you are always going to see something about 99% effective against the influenza virus, or 99% effective against MRSA, and you may be wondering how they test the effectiveness of a product. The first type of tests are called carrier tests. These are the oldest of the tests that have been used. They use a sterile carrier, such as a glass or a stainless steel cylinder or rod, and this um, carrier is contaminated by submersion in a liquid culture of a test organism. The carrier is then drained and dried for 40 minutes at 37 degrees Celsius, and this is what you see in the image. These carriers have been inoculated, or contaminated would be a better word, with a test organism. The cylinders are then placed in dilutions of the products for 10 minutes. 
The cylinders are then removed, placed in a nutrient broth, and check to see if the organisms have been killed or not. So they'll be incubated and observed for growth or viability. There's the AOAC use dilution carrier test. This one is standardized and uses Salmonella cholera suis, Staphylococcus aureus, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa test organisms. It uses sterile stainless steel cylinders and it requires 60 of them to do a single test for a single dilution. The limitations of this use dilution test is the load of bacteria on the sample is very hard to standardize. The number of organisms that stick to this cylinder, for example, uh, can, will not be exactly the same. And this is the reason you need 60 carriers for a single test. The survival of the bacteria after drying on the carrier also is not constant. Another type of test is called a suspension test. These suspension tests can be done in the presence of organic material and the absence of organic material. A suspension test done in the absence of organic material is called the Rydeal Walker method. This test products compared to phenol. The product, I'm sorry, the phenol is diluted 1 to 95 to 1 to 15 and the product is diluted 1 to 400 to 1 to 800. The test organism used is Salmonella typhi, and the subcultures are taken from all of the dilutions at two and a half, five, seven and a half, and ten minutes. A sample then is taken and spread onto auger plates to see how many organisms survive. Counting the number of colonies, then the phenol coefficient can be calculated. The phenol coefficient is represented as the dilution of test product that kills in 7.5 minutes compared to that of uh, for phenol. So the dilution of the test product that kills in 7.5 minutes is divided by the same for phenol and it gives us what is called the phenol coefficient. In the presence of organic material, the test is called the Chick-Martin test. The method is essentially the same as the Rydeal Walker except dilutions are made in yeast suspensions or fecal suspensions instead of water. This represents the organic material. This test adds Staphylococcus aureus to the protocol in addition to Salmonella typhi. Subcultures, instead of being taken at four intervals, are only taken at 30 minutes. The phenol coefficient is also calculated, represented by the mean concentration of phenol showing no growth after 30 minutes, divided by the same dilution for the test product that shows no growth at 30 minutes. Capacity tests are also done. These determine the ability of a disinfectant to retain activity in the presence of increasing load of contaminants. These are designed for products that are used to soak instruments and thus will have increasing amounts of soil or organic material. For example, if there is a uh, container of a disinfectant and added to that container will be medical instruments and they'll be added over a period of a day or perhaps even two days. There will be less organic material at the beginning of the addition of the uh, instruments than there will be at the end of the addition. So this test is designed to determine how long or how much load of contamination can that disinfectant take. It's referred to as a capacity. There's also something known as the Kelsey Sykes test. This is designed to determine the concentration of disinfectant that will be effective in clean conditions and in, in comparison to dirty conditions. The product is challenged by three successive additions of a bacterial suspension over 30 minutes under clean conditions and also under dirty conditions. And the dirty conditions will be represented by organic material. In the Kelsey Sykes test, it is yeast. The contact time is 8 minutes and the organisms, which are Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Proteus vulgaris, and Escherichia coli, are exposed to the test product for 8 minutes and then subcultured. There are also CIDL tests and these are the ones you are probably most familiar with. These are going to give us those results that we see on the bottles themselves, such as 99.99% 99 effective against the influenza virus. These are going to use specified strains of bacteria, viruses, fungi, spores, 
or mycobacteria. Mycobacteria is referred to as the tubercle bacillus. The viable count is determined at the start of the test. So going into the test, they know exactly how many microorganisms are present. Dilutions of the disinfectant are made in water. The test organism is added to it. We know the number of microorganisms that are added at that point. And then serum or yeast is added to simulate organic material if prescribed by the protocol. And then after a suitable time, samples are taken from the dilution, subcultured in a medium that is going to contain something that inactivates the disinfectant. That's important because you don't want the disinfectant to keep acting over a period of time. And then you'll determine how many of the microorganisms have been destroyed and calculate a percentage. So here you see on this Lysol spray that it kills 99.9% .9 of viruses and bacteria that were tested. The method we're going to be using in lab is called the disk diffusion method. This is not acceptable for industry, but it's a nice quick method to give us an idea of how effective a product is, is in comparison to another product. We begin by making a 0.5 McFarland suspension of an assigned organism in sterile water. You'll be assigned an organism and you are just going to mix it in water so that you have a turbidity that compares to this tube on the right, which is called a 0.5 McFarlane. This is going to standardize the amount of bacteria that you use on each Petri dish. The suspension is going to be ino inoculated as a lawn using a swab onto an appropriate medium. You're going to be using triptych soy auger and also blood auger. Blood auger has blood in in it, which is organic material, so it's going to show you the effect of organic material on the product. Does it inhibit it, for example? You'll then put the product on a six millimeter filter paper disc. You'll pick up that disc with sterile forceps and place it onto the inoculated auger, touching it ever so slightly so that it adheres to the auger. You'll invert the plate and incubated for 24 hours at 37 degrees Celsius. During this time the product is going to radially diffuse. It will diffuse out of the disc and into the auger. It will diffuse out and it will diffuse radially. Following incubation you're going to measure the diameter of the zone of inhibition. For example if you look at the quat with Staphylococcus aureus and Escherichia coli, you'll see there is a nice circular zone of inhibition of no growth around that product. The same with orthophenolphenol with Staphylococcus aureus and Escherichia coli. So you have a nice circular zone here and it's very easy to measure the diameter across. This entire diameter is recorded and then it can be used for comparison. If the diameter is irregular, like you see here, you're going to measure to the closest growth. So typically you will measure from the center of this disk to the closest growth, which is probably right about here, and then you will multiply by 2. So that's the radius multiplied by 2 to give you the diameter. If the diameter is not circular, again you will measure the radius from the center of the disc to the closest growth. And you can see that here with chlorine. Chlorine is a very irregular circle here as well, so you are going to measure it from the center of the disc to the closest growth. That's your radius, so the, the center of the disc will be 3 millimeters in. You'll measure it to the closest growth. Multiply that by 2. Radius times 2 gives you the diameter. The discs are 6 millimeters in diameter, and so your zone sizes are going to be larger than 6 millimeters. If there is no zone size, as you see here in Escherichia coli with hexachlorophene, and with Pseudomonas hexachlorophene, orthophenolphenol, and quat, the gross growth goes all the way up to the disc, we record this as NI, or no inhibition. For this test, we're going to make the assumption that the bigger the zone, the more effective the product. There are some flaws in this assumption. 
This disk diffusion method is not highly standardized. There are some standardized elements. We use the same inoculum of the bacteria on each sample. Every bacterium will be standardized to a 0.5 McFarland standard in sterile water. The disk size is always 6 millimeters. The type of auger that we use will be the same. The depth of the auger will be nearly the same. The technician pours these to as close as uh, 4 millimeters as possible. And the time and temperature of incubation will be kept cons constant. The amount of product that gets saturated into the disk, however, is not standardized. There are a number of limitations to this test. For example, the molecular weight. The molecular weight of the product or the active ingredient is not taken into account. You know that the smaller the molecular weight, the faster the product is going to diffuse through the auger. The larger molecular weight molecules, of course, are going to be impeded and will not diffuse as far. So this throws a monkey wrench into our analysis because we haven't standardized the molecular weights or normalized the molecular weights of these products. The test is also inappropriate for anything other than liquids and the liquids have to be diluted properly as they would be used in the home or the clinical setting. You can't use gels for this. Students often like to uh, propose a test with the hand sanitizers, but these are gels and they will not diffuse properly through the auger. And products that evaporate cannot be tested. For example, alcohols. Alcohols will evaporate and as a result their uh, effectiveness often will, will look much more effective, much less effective, excuse me, than they really are. Alcohol is a very commonly used product and has been used for a long time. It is very effective, but because it evaporates in this test, it appears to be ineffective. Now exercise 14 is going to be done very much the same as exercise 13. Let's talk about some antimicrobial susceptibility testing that is done in the clinical laboratory. Most common what you will see in the clinical laboratory is something known as the MIC or the minimum inhibitory concentration. This determines the minimum dilution of the antibiotic necessary to inhibit the test organism. This is known as a quantitative test because we're actually going to get a number value that will indicate the amount that the patient should receive in order to combat the infection. There are two methods that are used. The tube method is the first. This is time consuming and really doesn't have much of a place in the clinical laboratory, but it's very easy to understand how this is done. Dilutions of the antibiotic are prepared in a tube and then the test microorganism is added to it. It is incubated and then we look for growth. Growth is indicated by cloudiness. The last dilution that inhibits the microorganism is called the MIC. For the assay pictured here, the MIC for this antimicrobial is 1 to 8. So it's the last tube where we, uh, the last tube that is inhibitory to the microorganism. This tube is clear. This one, 1 to 16, is cloudy. So the M MIC is 1 to 8. Here we have positive and negative controls. More likely in the laboratory we're going to see a micro titer method. The micro titer method does the same thing, it just uses much smaller quantities. So we still have the antimicrobial agent that will be diluted in the wells. In this test there are e, e. coli is tested as well as Staphylococcus aureus. Again, the last dilution inhibitory to the microorganism is called the MIC. The MIC for E. coli is 1 to 8. The MIC for Staphylococcus aureus is 1 to 256. And the last rows again represent the controls. Typically when these are set up, the um, MIC assays, they are done with uh, multiple tip pipettes. They are incubated and a computer actually does the reading rather than the naked eye. The Kirby-Bauer test is the test that we are going to be using in lab. This test is done in clinical laboratories throughout the world. 
it's a bit more time consuming, you are going to be assigned an organism and this is the organism you are to use for your class assignment known as SimPatient. Make sure you write down the name of the organism when you do your, for, so that you can do your SimPatient properly. The Kirby-Bauer method is an antibiotic sensitivity test we really like to use the word susceptibility rather than sensitivity. Sensitivity refers to allergy in clinical situations. The procedure involves special paper discs. They have a specific amount of antibiotic. We place them on a lawn of bacteria. The bacteria have been, been inoculated onto a special type of medium. Again, a 0.5 McFarland standard is used to standardize the amount of bacteria. We incubate it. And just like with the antiseptic disdiffusion test, we measure the zone of inhibition. One nice thing about this test is there is an antibiotic disc dispenser, so we don't have to soak each disc individually, nor do we have to place them on the auger. This disc dispenser with the magazines of antibiotic discs has a plunger on the top. We set it on top of the auger plate, hit the plunger, and then the discs are delivered and tamped down automatically on the plate. The Kirby-Bauer test is a highly standardized test. It uses Mueller-Hinton or Mueller-Hinton blood auger depending upon the organism. This auger has a pH of 7.2 to 7.4. This is going to facilitate the diffusion of the antibiotics that are in the disc. The plates are poured consistently to four millimeters deep. This is going to influence, of course, how the antibiotic is going to diffuse down and radially. We use a 0.5 McFarland inoculum in sterile water or saline. We're going to eyeball this in the lab, but in the clinical situation, we actually use an instrument called a spectrophotometer to ensure that we have the same optical density of the organism in each tube. This standardizes the amount of bacteria that we put on the plate. If we put too much bacteria, we're going to have a falsely small diameter of inhibition. The disc content of antibiotic is standardized by the manufacturer. These discs are going to have expiration dates on them and they're going to be loaded into the disc dispenser. We do an incubation of 16 to 18 hours at 37 degrees Celsius. We use a standardized interpretation table to interpret the results after we measure the zones of inhibition. It's important to remember in this test that bigger is not better. We assumed that bigger was better in the antiseptic test in the previous exercise, but here bigger does not mean better. The Kirby-Bauer test is known as a qualitative test. We do not get numbers as a result we simply get values known as susceptible, intermediate, or resistant. There are no degrees of susceptibility. The only way to determine degrees of susceptibility would be to do, to do an MIC. So we'll have a zone diameter interpretation table. We'll look a lot like this. And after you measure the zone of inhibition, you will compare it to this table. For example, with ampicillin, if you measure a zone smaller than 13 millimeters or equal to 13 millimeters, it tells us there's a zone around here but that isn't enough to kill the microorganism. So the organism would be resistant to ampicillin. On the other hand, if we measure a zone of greater than or equal to 17 millimeters, we say the organism is susceptible to the antibiotic. Now let's say we had a zone of 28 millimeters for penicillin and 40 millimeters for ampicillin. Ampicillin has a bigger zone than penicillin. Can we say that ampicillin is more effective than penicillin? The answer is no, we cannot because this is a qualitative test. Bigger is not better. Susceptible is susceptible. In order to determine if ampicillin truly was a more effective agent against this microorganism, we would have to do an MIC. There's another test that combines the MIC and the Kirby-Bauer test, and this is called the E-test. It uses strips which are impregnated with gradually decreasing concentrations of the antimicrobial agent. 
The plate is inoculated in the same way, making a lawn with a point five McFarland standard of the microorganism, and then these uh, strips are placed in a spoke-like pattern on the petri dish. After incubation, the MIC is determined by reading the value where the growth meets the strip. So here you can see the growth meets the strip here at 0.25 milligrams per milliliter, and the MIC for this antibiotic can be determined. This looks like a great test, which it is, except it is extremely expensive. Uh, these test strips are quite expensive, and they're not used by the clinical laboratory because it is much less expensive to do a microtiter assay. There are a number of limitations of this antimicrobial testing. Very often, the test conditions in vitro, that means outside of the body, cannot duplicate what's going on inside of the human body, known as in vivo. We can't consider the pharmacon pharmacokinetics of the antibiotic. In other words, we can't consider in this test what the body does to the drug because we're looking at it in vitro. We are not considering the pharmacodynamics of the antibiotic. There is something known as the post-antibiotic effect, a persistent suppression of bacterial growth after only a brief exposure of the organism to the antibiotic. Well, after the organism is exposed to the antibiotic and the antibiotic is removed, there still is a persistent effect and this cannot be considered in this test. And finally, it does not consider variability in drug distribution to infection sites within the body. This is an in vitro test and we don't know from this test if the the antimicrobic is going to reach the target. For example, if there's a urinary tract infection, this does not tell us whether or not this drug is going to reach the urine in its entirety in order to be effective. See you in lab.